So today, uh, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll just do some uh, short introduction, uh, making sure that everyone is here. So today we're going to talk about a more philosophical topic of uh, quality metrics, how to build them scientifically, how to approach it pragmatically, how to make sure we just do not give generic advice. I mean, it's good if you have this and this and that, and then you suddenly realize there is no way how you can uh, really do that at your company. Rather than that, we will provide you with a full, complete set of building blocks uh, that are published. You will be able to find them using the links from this presentation as soon as it's published on the internet, and you will be able to build your own metrics very quickly using those building blocks. They're absolutely public, they're absolutely free, and the only thing we are humbly asking of you is uh, to provide uh, references as far as you're using them in your work. We would really appreciate that. Uh, and I really hope that what we're going to present helps you. But uh, prior to providing the building blocks, I need to explain the model. That is, why do we need to do it exactly like that, what it's based on, and why you should use this model rather than something else available on the market. So that's generally the topic of this presentation. Okay, so thank you so much for coming, and let's start, because we have plenty of slides here. And otherwise, uh, I'll just have to rush through them, and that would be a disaster. Okay, so first of all, what do you mean under quality pillars? So these are the primary things uh, that you need to have at your company in general in order to have a sustainable business. So the first three of them, it's having a great team, having a good supply chain, and having strong, viable processes, it more attests uh, to overall business maturity. The last two, namely quality framework, and the quality framework includes methodology, metrics, and the approach to it, and uh, quality automation and tools, these two are uh, actually telling uh, an outside auditor an absolutely different thing, that is, whether your company has a general long-term quality and process vision or whether it's just patching holes and fixing uh, particular problems without any vision. So in this particular presentation, uh, we'll concentrate on the highlighted one, that is quality methodology, quality metrics and approach. So. In this presentation, whatever you read on the slide, I'm not going to waste time on this, but this should be a very familiar device. I, I can bet that most of you know its name. So I'd ask uh, anyone who knows what this thing is uh, to raise their hands. You've all heard the name. No, this thing, the picture, what is it? No. Okay, so that's the same thing about quality. Everyone is talking about it, everybody implies something, but nobody knows uh, how to do it scientifically. By the way, this thing is an astrolabe used by uh, medieval sailors uh, to navigate their ships. Okay, so first of all, the first most important thing here is that quality actually is not a single figure produced by some quality metric. As soon as it's a single figure, something is wrong or something is missing. Quality is a 3D thing, exactly like the space around us. Generally, we can think of a space that's unidimensional where we just measure a distance from myself, say, to somebody sitting right there using uh, just the distance. But in some cases, when I have to go around trees or just uh, dance my way through a crowd, that's absolutely not sufficient. You need more coordinates. 
so generally what I'm saying is that uh, the basics were laid out in a venerable LPAC work dated back to 1966. Most of you were not born at that time. So there, uh, it's a very interesting experiment. People were actually doing the first ever machine translation experiment. They were actually translating from Russian into English, and they were translating Russian intercepts because native countries tried to figure out what the Russians are doing. I mean, or, uh, well, to be more precise, the USSR. So that's when they started. And at that time, they needed to figure out some criteria to measure quality. And this fundamental work that used uh, not only, say, engineers or project managers, but also a lot of scientists were involved, it produced uh, just uh, the general thing. And then uh, I would say that I started on it earlier, but then I read this work and I really was fascinated by the fact how much it aligns with what I thought. So I just developed the concept in my subsequent work. So what does 3D quality mean? So generally quality dimensions include two holistic, well, may I say coordinates, and one atomistic coordinate, and I'll just explain what it is because it sounds very scientific. So uh, of two holistic, the first one is holistic adequacy. I mean, whoever visited our previous presentation, uh, they had a glimpse at that. So holistic adequacy tells you how well your translation reflects the overall meaning and message of the source. The other holistic uh, factor is holistic intelligibility, or in case of text, readability. That is, how easy is it to read the translated text? By the way, they are not dependent on each other. You can have a text that's generally adequate, written by a techie, but still hardly readable. Most of you have uh, definitely encountered such texts. Or it can be a very smooth text that sounds perfect, but when you read deeper into that, you do not understand a thing, or you figure out that it's complete rubbish and it doesn't mean exactly what the source meant as far as you can understand the source. Why holistic? Because a single segment or a single sentence is not sufficient to understand the overall meaning and message of the text. Holistic factors only apply to contiguous reasonably sized pieces of text, say like a large paragraph or maybe a section of a document or maybe a whole document. It depends on the particular context or situation, whatever you like. But the important thing is you can apply it to a particular sentence, but it doesn't tell you much about the text as a whole. Moreover, even if you found a couple of incorrect translations, say, in a text. Sometimes you can reconstruct the original meaning and generally you still understand the message perfectly. It's readable. It's fine. So you can live with it unless you seek perfection. So you can generally read with, uh, live with it under most circumstances if, unless you're a perfectionist. So then atomistic quality. Atomistic quality is the quality you've got used to. It's when we look at particular, say, segments or sentences or strings uh, that uh, actually the text contains, and we count uh, broken tags, uh, dual spaces, wrong capitalization, uh, local issues, and all other things. They are why we call that atomistic, because it happens at the atomic level, that is, at a segment level or a sentence level. A broken tag in one string doesn't mean anything and uh, doesn't matter for the other string. So with these things, uh, they are kind of uh, more traditional. Uh, you've got used to them. We just assign certain severities to those things, summarize them, and get uh, this or that type of an atomistic quality metric. We'll uh, talk about it more uh, a little bit later on. But that's the concept. OK. So. Uh, the 3D model concentrates on holistic. Why? Well, first of all, because the whole is always more important than in its constituents. I'm sorry. Uh, and it's obvious it's kind of a philosophical principle of life. Sometimes the whole is absolutely not like its constituents, 
because you never know uh, what your radio or your smartphone is assembled using a thousand parts. But you, if you, I show you the part, most probably you'll not recognize it. You've never seen it. You've seen the whole, that is the smartphone, has, that has a certain function. And if you are not convinced, I'll just remind you the parable of six blind men and an elephant. Okay, great. So that's why the whole is more important. If you are not convinced yet, I'll show you another thing. All these three, one is a horticultural sculpture on the right-hand side. In the middle, you see a cartoon picture, and on the left is a photograph of a real elephant. All of them are elephant, elephants, and if you're not sure, you can ask your kid. Okay, so back to the future, back to this LPAC work. So what they actually formulated, and I really love to read it aloud, because that was more than 50 years ago, actually. And then people were, have forgotten about it and started counting dual spaces and all the other stuff, for forgetting about the important things. That is, so in this work, I mean, it's kind of, it's not ancient, but it feels mid-20th century. It was reasoned that two major characteristics of a translation are its intelligibility and its fidelity to the sense of the original text, adequacy. And uh, they also said, uh, I've already voiced it, uh, that uh, they are more or less independent, that you can have an easily readable but incorrect text or the other way around. So, the ancient concept, if you remember, of the world was that uh, underneath all of it is the turtle, but uh, there are three elephants, elephants that are actually holding the earth, and that's why I'm continuing the elephant theme. So, elephant number one, adequacy, that creates uh, the part of the methodology and the structure. Once again, it's how correctly does the translation reveal the message and the meaning of the original. The second elephant is intelligibility. Once again, how easy it is to read or perceive if it's, say, video or audio content. So these things apply to the content as a whole or to large chunks of pieces. They cannot be combined, and I'll show you later that they cannot be judged using a regular criteria, but rather you need threshold-based criteria. We'll talk about it later. So for each of these, we set a, an acceptance threshold that really depends on the content, of it, on its visibility, importance and everything else. That is, if we have a home page of a website, it's outrageously important to have it perfect. If we have a Q&A or a knowledge base, it's not that important. And we can lower our uh, expectations. The third one, the quilted elephant, is atomistic quality. It's uh, quilted because there are a thousand uh, issues or errors that constitute this quality. Uh, here it's the wrong capitalization, there it's a uh, broken tag, uh, there it's uh, the wrong date format, or something like that. And this, we just use a simple formula where we will count all these errors, weight them, and produce an error rating. So all, overall, two threshold-based uh, evaluations, and the third one, which is formula-based, and also we apply threshold, whether it's a pass or a no pass, or at least what's our attitude towards it. Uh, that's uh, what we call the quality triangle. Okay, so one important thing that I need to mention is semi-objective nature of holistic quality. Just think of you. You are reading a text. It may be a, just a good enough text, but some of you who are, say, in good mood, uh, had a nice dinner, sitting comfortably, may feel more relaxed, and they'll say on a zero to nine scale, assign uh, eight. Somebody else who didn't sleep well, who has a hangover, or just uh, something like that, I'll not point to anyone. So uh, these people will probably considerably more demanding, more fastidious, and they will assign a rating of six or seven. It's just like this road. 
I, I mean, yeah, that looks like w w the road we have to take uh, over time uh, coming to this uh, welcoming and hospitable place. So the thing is, if I ask you to evaluate this road on a scale between zero and nine, with nine being a perfect uh, road without any potholes, and zero being uh, just uh, something that only a tank uh, can manage. What you'll produce, and I'm absolutely sure, is uh, there'll be a certain spread. You'll not all of you will produce one and the same rating, but they will be not completely arbitrary. It will not be white noise. Probably none of you will assign zero unless you uh, drive a tank every day. And probably none of you will assign nine, especially if you are driving a sports car. So if we have a panel, I mean, if we are lucky enough, just if I asked all of you to uh, uh, actually rate this road, we'll have a certain uh, picture of what you produce. So generally, there'll be a picture, and it's not white noise. Rather, we'll have something like this. What I sh I'm showing you here, mm, I mean, it's a small thing, but I'll explain. So along the x-axis, uh, you have the grades assigned by actual reviewers for a text. It's from 0 to 10. And uh, the vertical axis uh, reflects the number of people uh, who evaluated it similarly for each rating. So that's the picture you're going to get. Not all rates are equal, but you always have a kind of a close to normal distribution around a certain average. Here we had 18 people contributing to this experiment, but generally you can expect everybody to produce something like this. That is, it's not absolutely arbitrary, but it's not completely predictable. It's not completely objective. That's why we call them semi-objective. So the question is, okay, we understand it's not accurate by design. How do we, do, how do we deal with that? I mean, uh, in real life, nobody has the privilege of using a whole panel of experts reading one and the same text and grading it. It's ridiculous. You have a single translator. You never know whether they slept well, how fastidious they are, and all that stuff, what do you do? Is it hopeless? Well, luckily for us, it's not. So, in general, only a very, very tiny fraction of the people will be completely immature to assign an average text a grade of zero or, say, nine or 10 out of 10. Most of you will produce a, exactly a distribution like I showed you. So uh, if you ha can grade uh, the road using only four different grades from left to right, here you find a giraffe within a pothole, and on the right-hand side is the perfect scenario. So most of you looking at the road you took to get to this particular UT camp will probably assign one of these two uh, grades in the middle. So that's exactly what happens in real life. And that is why we can use these criteria, understanding that we'll have a certain curve, a distribution curve. It somehow depends on the individual who works with it, who judges your particular translation. But generally, it's not completely unpredictable. It's not white noise. Far from it, actually. So the question is, how do we deal with that? And the obvious answer is, we just assign an acceptance threshold. Because we do not know whether your uh, reviewer is very fastidious or relaxed, but we definitely know that if we uh, put the acceptance threshold somewhere on the left-hand slope of uh, the curve, generally will accommodate most reasonable reviews, and that's where we need to cut off and, uh, say, tell uh, the difference between something that's not acceptable and something that's acceptable. The other question is where we place this particular magic number. And this really depends on the content, on the context, on how important this particular content is, and where do you really want it. 
So, uh, for example, if it's a marketing text, you'll probably say, okay, uh, I want at least 8 out of 10. So it should be either perfect or near perfect. If it's a technical text, yeah, and, and it's a pity because I, I, I see as soon as uh, the sun shines on us, regrettably, you cannot see the screen very well. Uh, I apologize. So, as far as you're dealing with some purely technical content, like Q&A, probably you'll be less fastidious, less demanding, and uh, you'll ask uh, for a five or four just uh, as a passing threshold. So that's the whole idea behind that. So, what we need, and what we need is a scale. The problem is that unless you have a scale, and I just ask you to judge something based on a scale, uh, say, uh, between zero and nine, There'll be no criteria. I mean, everybody knows that zero is terrible and nine is perfect, but what does six mean, for God's sake? And I'll ask an even kind of more demanding question. How does six differ from seven? And there, everyone here in the crowd will have uh, their own answer, and that answer will probably differ. So in order to make it more objective, we really need to create a scale that everyone, I mean every reviewer, uses the scale and tries to stick to it. And in this case, we cannot make it completely objective, but we reach a certain level of objectivity when we can measure and we, we can definitely say that this one is not acceptable, this one is marginally acceptable, this one is really good. So that's exactly what we try to do. We created this both scales for holistic adequacy and uh, holistic intelligibility at Logros IT. They're very well defined. They are a zero to nine scales, that is a 10 point scales, and I'll explain a little bit later why it's so important. And generally, this means that, first of all, it doesn't take much time for the reviewer to go through the scale and familiarize herself or himself with it. The second thing is, that way, your judgments are con considerably more objective because at least you try to not to figure out what you think or what you feel, but rather try to comply with a certain uh, system of evaluation. Well, uh, most of us would prefer that. And that's where exactly we're saying, okay, so this is eight, this is uh, good, uh, I mean, a smile. This is five, that's kind of tolerable at best. And this is below it, it's intolerable. So these are the scales. It's not here for you to read, but you'll be able to access it online. I mean, they're well defined. And then we go with the third one, the third component, hopefully you haven't forgot, that it's atomistic quality. And Fyodor will say a couple of words about it. Thank you, Leonid. Okay, let's get back to atomistic uh, quality. Uh, atomistic quality is measured uh, in all existing quality metrics. Uh, it applies to quality issues uh, at the atomic level of the content, uh, unlike holistic. It applies to sentences, strings, translation units, uh, small pieces. It includes uh, issues like uh, terminology, um, deviations or inconsistency, uh, adherence to style guide, uh, country standards, etc. Uh, text, uh, placeholders, formatting. Uh, it also complements uh, holistic evaluation. These checks can be uh, completely or mostly uh, automated uh, and that's really great. A lot of uh, QA checkers use um, atomistic uh, quality checks. Uh, the example of uh, comprehensive issue catalog uh, or error typology, uh, um, you can see it, I hope that you can see it on the screen. Most it's probably uh, not. multidimensional quality metrics. Uh, anyway, you will be able to download the presentation a bit later. Okay, just... Um, So, uh, what does the metric comprise? Uh, it comprises of uh, methodology, it's how you measure quality. 
Uh, it has uh, acceptance uh, I'm afraid that you've uh, skipped through quite a number of slides, actually. Why? I don't know. No. No? No. Okay. <laughs> Maybe you can, cannot, it's a uh, glimmer and you can see. Um, so you have acceptance thresholds, what is good and what is bad. Uh, for holistic evaluation, you have scales. Uh, for atomistic, you have uh, scalable error typology, severity or weight for atomistic errors, and quality evaluation formulas. Uh, I cannot see anything. Oh. So, uh, what is wrong with those traditional models, uh, quality models, like MQM or DQF and others? Uh, we think uh, it's ignoring priorities of actual human sentiment. It's uh, sacrificing sentiment for tradition, familiarity, like uh, we always did that. It's um, centered around translation units, not uh, on text as a whole. It's getting only a shadow uh, of the actual 3D quality. It's missing uh, holistic evaluations and using a single quality coordinate. Uh, we also think it's uh, wasteful and uh, detailed analysis of all translation units uh, is uh, excessive in many cases. Uh, analyzing false positives is tedious. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you did uh, receive uh, huge uh, reports from your clients where you need to comment all false positives. Uh, it's unsuitable for community or low-budget projects. Um, yes, it's uh, often obvious that translation is poor after reading it for five minutes, uh, but you still need to follow the protocol. Um, and uh, you have a question why. I can see the text is uh, BS. I, I, why should I evaluate it? Uh, I <laughs> if it looks like um, mm, BS, if it smells like it, so why should I describe it anymore? Still, uh, this matrix uh, requires uh, a lot of work. Uh, we also have uh, almost unmanageable error typology. There are uh, almost 200 uh, of error categories and subcategories, uh, numeral, uh, numerous hierarchy levels. Um, it's very hard to navigate. It's hard to memorize all these categories and apply them. Uh, and um, the reviewers uh, need to uh, have extensive training, the QA experts. It also has lack of scalability because uh, there is uh, same huge uh, issues catalog for all cases. Uh, only is issue weights or severities, uh, like we call them, URI. Uh, there is, uh, there are no lower complexity alternatives. And uh, we typically need fewer hierarchical levels, uh, categories, or subcategories. Uh, you can, I hope you can see uh, some notes uh, on the slide, but uh, uh, I won't just, uh, just want to summarize that uh, it's not optimized for the real production process. Because uh, you just need to do a lot of extra work and holistic evaluation allows you to spend five minutes <laughs> to understand whether the text is uh, of normal quality or substandard. Thank you. Okay, so, yeah, thank you. Okay, so, okay, so the question is, uh, why did we mention, uh, say, MQM or DQF in the first place? Because generally the picture was like that. You have on the two relatively popular, relatively available, and at least public 
uh, that is free standards. And uh, one of them, uh, MQM, why am I mentioning it? Because most of what clients typically do, they uh, apply this or that, uh, say, iteration of MQM. And MQM was developed by a German institution called DFKE. Uh, th they were very scientific. There are approximately 190 categories, each with a definition, usage examples, and all that stuff. The problem is it's huge. And the second problem is, regrettably, it's extremely academic. That it's absolutely not suitable for real life. Its structure is weird. It doesn't conform to the real production cycle that we have in the industry. And as Fyodor already mentioned, it's not scalable. So what do we do with that? And actually it turned out that, on the other hand, we absolutely do not want to waste it. I mean, they've defined so many things. They've created those categories. They named them, they assigned tags. I mean, it would be a wa such a waste to forget about it. So we decided to rework it a little bit. And you'd be surprised how little you needed to rework to provide good structure and make it a working thing. So in our case, we just go from a unidimensional uh, single atomistic quality measurement uh, that's uh, time consuming and theoretically it's either using a special proprietary system, a proprietary metric developed by the client that they can never explain why exactly did they create this metric and why these categories, why these weights. It's just, it just happened and it's just there. Or you can use something public like MQM or uh, Taos DQF. They've been publicizing it a lot, but actually Taos DQF is a copy of MQM. Because it's, uh, I mean, originally what Taos came up with was completely inconsistent and didn't make much sense. And then uh, European authorities asked them to harmonize the two. As a result, now we have kind of two copies of DQF. I mean, one is the original MQM, and the other one uh, is uh, that Tau sells as DQF. So the thing is, it's the same thing. So what we needed to do, just add some structure first, and second, add two holistic coordinates. And then we can apply the quality triangle approach and make it scalable, make it economic, make it viable, and uh, make it actually live, uh, providing all the building blocks you need. Okay. So that adds long-awaited scalability because no one wants to work with 190 categories. Just think of that. When you have a reviewer and suppose you're doing an LQA, you need to know all of these 200 categories by heart because otherwise you'll assign a wrong one and sometimes uh, they sound very, very similar. You just need to know. And add to that that it's a three to four level hierarchy and you need to go down this, the, the right branch and use uh, the, the right ramification. It, it's just terrible. While academically it looks perfect. So the thing is, uh, what we've created is the quality triangle approach, which is completely scalable, depending on what you need, and you just adjust the thresholds and uh, the catalog itself. We'll talk about it a little bit later. Depending on that, we can cover any combination of time versus price versus quality or uh, depth of analysis. And uh, we try to put expectations first. So without talking more about big theory, let's go to details. So first of all, we called it MQM Plus because they, des they deserve their credit. I mean, they've done an incredible work of uh, classifying something. So what we did, actually, this huge complex thing that was very hard to use is very easily transformed into something simple. So what we did, we restructured it and made sure that it looks just like a cabbage head. So on the left, the big cabbage head, you have all those almost 200 categories from MQM and the only thing we did, we restructured them so that it gets scalable, so that we do not uh, combine uh, categories related to page setting with categories related to translation to categories related with programmers' mistakes that is actually poor uh, 
localized ability. And uh, within the MKM, they were all grouped together under one and the same category. So it was unusable because as a translator, for instance, you cannot absolutely be responsible for, for what the DTP guys do or for what the programmers didn't think of and why this sentence cannot be combined uh, using just a concatenation of two strings. In some languages, it doesn't make sense. So then you can peel off the leaves that is, in our case, it's the hierarchical level. That is, instead of three to four levels, you only have two levels with only 60 to 70 categories. It's a simpler structure, and it's fully downward or upward compatible, just like you like it. Then you peel some more leaves, and we are left with a very simple flat structure that contains nine to 10 categories, flat, and we assign uh, values or error ratings to each of them. And finally, I mean, uh, let's be logical here, we get, back, we get down to the stump. And the stump, you would think that it's uh, a joke when you use a single category, when you reduce the whole atomistic catalog to a single category. Actually, it's not. It's exactly what you need to do when you do not have money, when it's a community-funded project, and we, you just have a couple of hours that uh, a person has dedicated to the cause, say, uh, evaluating the translation quality of a public portal that provides certain human value. And it's all amateur work. It's all done on your own free time. So you need to provide a metric for them as well, for a community project. So the stump is not useless. Actually, you can use it. So how do you use the whole structure? And we published it. I mean, all the categories and all those layers are available. You'll be able to find them online when the presentation is published. So generally, how we did it? You'd be surprised. We only had to move certain categories. I mean, we moved only 26 out of 200. We added 12. We removed seven. Some of them were simply duplicate or redundant. And uh, I'm, I'm not surprised because when they created 200, it was easy to get lost. Uh, we renamed four and changed some definitions in seven. So actually it was, well, I wouldn't say it was cosmetic work, but we completely restructured it. And now it's a nice clean cabbage head where you can peel the leaves off and use any metric or any complexity of the error typology you'd like that's relevant for the cause, that's relevant for your projects, that's relevant for your product or uh, for the area. So that's it, complete upward compatibility. How to select it? So my general recommendation is simple. I will not read all of this and we do not have time for that. We'd rather answer questions or have a discussion. It's simple. The simpler choice, the better. I mean, as far as you can deal with just nine major categories, say, like, for instance, country standards, one of them, and all of the details like date format uh, violation or sorting format violation, they all fall under country standards or local. That's just an example. The other one is technical. That is, whether you've broken a tag or you're omitted a placeholder or something like that, it's this category and all that stuff. So if you can go with that, if you can live with that, and actually we discovered that most clients are fine with that, you're good. But if you've assigned certain values, uh, say certain weights to these things, you can easily use these same weights for the catalog of any complexity. So whatever you select, they're fully compatible in any case because it all goes up to the parent category that comprises a certain number of child categories. So generally do not use or do not apply a complex error typology if a simpler one works for you. Do not try to impress yourself or your clients <laughs> or your vendors with the number of categories you use. So details. Of course, uh, if you create a metric, what you need, okay, okay, you've got the scalable, nice error typology and you select any number of categories. What you've got, you also need certain building blocks like severity scale. That is how severe this or that error is. 
The other thing, you need to be able to differentiate between regular errors and outrageous errors, or what we call them showstoppers. Okay, simple thing. You can have a typo on the home page. In one uh, case, it's just a typo, nothing bad. In another case, you suddenly have a curse word there, and it's absolutely unacceptable. The type of the error is exactly the same. The category of the error is exactly the same. So the only way you can actually escalate this, and typically these showstoppers are not acceptable, and I can tell you stories about it, is by assigning it an incredible weight so that uh, it, the whole LQA is definitely a fail. So you'll need the weight system, uh, which is easy, and once again, it's uh, no big deal, and we've published a sample uh, severity scale uh, for you to use if you really want. And then you apply a simple formula. That is, you multiply a, a, the count of each error by the weight, and you summarize all of this, and you get the error rating. The only problem with it is that humans typically prefer something on a scale between 0 and 1, or say 0 and 100 percent, and the error rating, I mean, the more errors you have, the higher the rating. It's counterintuitive, plus it can shoot through the sky, and that's the problem. Uh, the sky is not the limit. So generally, we try to normalize it. Uh, and it's not, it's not hard, and we've published a typical approach to normalizing the error rating and making it comfortable so that for a normal text, it goes somewhere around 60% or more, and anything below 60% or just uh, negative means that it's unacceptable. There is one important thing that I want uh, to talk about before uh, completing this presentation, and this is the price of objectivity. That's very important, because we really want our quality evaluations to be objective, because otherwise we just completely lose uh, the purpose. The problem with it is that the objectivity has its price. You have to train your reviewers. They need to use uh, the metric, they need to know it, they need to know error typologies. You need them to have at their disposal the same things that translators have. That is glossaries, guidelines, and everything. What's the price of, say, saving on these things? That is not making sure that everything is available to the reviewers or using people who are not professional, who may be subjective. It's loss of objectivity. Whoever doesn't see it, uh, it's a kitten looking in the mirror and seeing a lion. And this is a very typical scenario when, say, clients are saving on reviews and using their local in-country uh, subsidiary employees who are not professional translators or reviewers who've never got hold of, say, glossaries or TMs or direct instructions, and these guys review, and sometimes they have no idea of uh, the accepted terminology or the standards, or how the previous version of the product was translated, and that's how their reviews get anything but objective. That's just a typical example. So what we're giving you is the whole set of building blocks, that is, two scales for holistic evaluations that you can use in your work when you're building metrics. Your only goal is to set the thresholds, th that is, how exactly, how good, how exactly good, or how exactly tolerable should uh, you uh, get this uh, holistic quality. Plus, we get you the full uh, cabbage head structure, you get uh, the full catalog, that is, error typology. You get uh, severity scales, and you get some recommendations on how to measure it and how to apply it. And basically, this is it. You set the thresholds depending on uh, the materials you are dealing with, the uh, subject area, uh, figuring out how conspicuous the materials are and everything, and there you go. So you have all the building blocks to create 3D metrics. Of course, Holistic evaluations are not applicable anywhere. If you have a non-contiguous set of, say, error messages that are not related to each other, you'll have to deal with regular atomic evaluations, but you can easily do that. Going from 3D to 1D is easy. 
you just do not apply something that's not applicable. And when you are doing holistic evaluations, just try to select the best size of a, a piece you are evaluating. That is, for instance, you've got a document with 10 chapters. You select a chapter as a single, say, brick, and then you have 10 independent evaluations. You get an average, and that's your holistic evaluation. That's basically it. And uh, I mean, all of the, the, the other things that you'll be able to get online, just explain how it works, how it's applied. But uh, I really want to leave more time for questions. I'm sorry it's a complex topic. I tried to make it as understandable as possible. And I'm really sorry if it made you fall asleep or uh, if you ha have got a vertigo, but hopefully not. And finally, I just wanted to show you a small illustration. Actually, we've implemented this model and created an automated quality assurance portal where clients can do anything to the metrics they create. Each client has their own metric. They can add to the typology if they have some specific things. They can adjust tolerance levels. They can apply different metrics to different types of materials. Say marketing leaflets are absolutely different from regular software. And there the client just uh, places a project. The project manager on our end, uh, they review it. Uh, they run automation to do word counts and uh, figure out whether it can be automatically analyzed because not everything is analyzable. I mean, it could be a video clip, for God's sake. Then uh, we do... Uh, atomic quality checks using our own tool, and this tool uses an API, so it connects directly to cloud cat tools, whatever they are. So you get a kind of a pre-review. Of course, there could be false positives there, but at least whatever criteria we have there, uh, we automate whatever we can. Then we have our team uh, to do a manual review. And one of the conditions is that they go through at least all the errors logged by automation. Moreover, if they log a false positive, this false positive is memorized. So for the next build, it will, within the same context, it will be automatically marked as a false positive. So you do not have to go through 10,000 false positives with every new product version or every new build within the same context. As far as the context is different, sorry, we cannot automatically assign it as a false positive. You'll have to review it. Then we go through LKA report validation because every error should be uh, commented. There should be a normal explanation in, say, English or whatever the client's language is so that they can understand it, that all of the descriptions make sense, that you have sufficient definitions, that is, where it happens, what exactly is the problem, and what would you suggest to fix it. Finally, it goes to the client, and we go through a review cycle, or say uh, what, what, what we call uh, cycles, uh, with the tr client and potentially the translation team, because sometimes the reviewers can be wrong. They didn't know the context. The translators have been working on this for years, and they know that here we have terrible length limitations. Here, it's the traditional terminology used by another module. We have to use it even though we know it's not optimal. So we go through several rounds of reconciliation, depending on how tolerant we are. We do not recommend more than one or two. We go through the arbitration stage, where there is severe disagreement. And when it's over, we finally deliver to the client. That's just an illustration of how this can be applied. And all the metrics are adjustable, so each client can use their own, can create their own, can adjust based on the bricks we provide. OK, thank you so much. You've been a very patient audience. I really appreciate you going through that without running away in scales. And if you've got any questions, you are very welcome. Yes, first of all, thank you very much. This is the second presentation I can mention as the first one that uh, is worth coming here and listening. 
Uh, and uh, the question is the following. Um, as you know, uh, the huge translation hubs, huge translation companies, they have their own metrics. Uh, most likely they are not holistic, they are at atomic, yes. Uh, should we convince this, our clients uh, to have this combination of holistic and atomic approach or we just have to follow and give as they, as they want us to consider the quality when we work for them? So what's the word? How, how do we have to convince them that uh, on the atomic approach is not the right thing? Uh, great question. So to tell you the truth, when we were creating this, our goal was to convince uh, direct clients, not MLVs. Well, so first of all, the goal was different. And talking about the big picture, and I'll try to be as, uh, say, general as possible, not go into, into very much detail, but there are two reasons uh, for using the quality triangle approach. So first of all, it does comprise uh, the atomic approach. It doesn't strip anything, but you get a considerably better scalability that most of whatever they've developed in-house or uh, if they use, say, the MQM or DQF, simply is not true. Second, it really saves a lot of time and money because in some cases you do a holistic approach and you just scan through the text. It's much, much faster than marking all the errors, all the issues. Going through that, it takes a lot of time. And, you, and this provides a great indication and we've got another work, I, I mean, I'm not mentioning it here, where we're proving that actually holistic evaluations provide a very good overview of overall quality. As a result, you can figure out, based on the holistic overview, whether it's really worth to do the atomic one, that is, go deeper, spend more time, and figure out what's wrong. Typically, you do it when holistic overview provides kind of poor grades. But if it shows that everything is fine, your customers will most probably be satisfied because they are normal people like us. I mean, they read the text if they can read it, if they can understand it, it's generally good. They, they live with a couple of typos or some broken tag if generally they can understand the content. I mean, once again, it doesn't work under all circumstances, but mostly it's absolutely fine. So generally, it saves them time. It saves you time because if you run it, it's a fraction of the cost of, at, of an in-depth atomic evaluation, but you know which areas are really bad, which areas require more attention, and where you concentrate your efforts. So that is why I would humbly suggest you to try to implement it somewhere, especially when you're talking about big volumes, where really you really want to save on the cost and sometimes the turnaround time for LQAs in-house. And whether your client is really interested or not, it's not so important because if you figured out early enough that you need to retranslate this piece because it was just BS, it's bad for some reason, it's, it gives you a very good indication. Uh, I Personally, I would not say uh, preach uh, to the choir. I will not honestly try to uh, explain all the advantages and details to big MLVs. They've got dedicated people who deal with that, and I think it's their decision. So I wouldn't preach to them, but I'm more than happy to share. Hopefully I answered it. So, so there is a person who's not asleep here. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, my question about the holistic method. Um, the problem is that uh, when you use atomic, you may uh, pinpoint the problems. You can show the error of improvements. But you know, when, we're, when you're giving holistic feedback, like this, tech, th this translation is quite good, but needs some minor improvement, and that's it. The person who did this translation does not have idea what to improve because, it, well, they've got the opinion, they're good enough, but what they can do if they cannot really understand what you mean by that? A great question. I omitted it uh, during the presentation not to spend time. I hope that somebody will ask. So, uh, 
in the metric that we developed, the 3D. Of course, that's the goal. I mean, the holistic evaluation should not take as much time, but every reviewer needs to provide a brief overview of major systemic issues and a brief overview of the overall text. So why did they assign this particular rating? That is, it's not complete, it's not thorough, because that's the, that's the goal, we get it quickly. But they need to provide all systemic errors, or at least list them. Okay, so here you're consistently using a wrong term, or just uh, something that's ambiguous, and because of that, uh, the consumer uh, may uh, incorrectly interpret something. Or here, the tone is wrong. I mean, it's too formal, or too informal, depending on the context. I mean, for God's sake, it's a computer game and you're writing as if you're writing a manual for the students, or something like that. So generally, we ask for that, and it's very explicit. So uh, this is not part of the model, this is part of the metric. That is, what do you ask to provide? So in our case, that's how we solve it. And that's the instruction we provide uh, to the reviewers. No questions? Okay, thank you very much indeed. I really appreciate that. Much. And if you think about something later on, you are very welcome to approach us and uh, we'll talk. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you, Leonid. Thank you, Father.